thanks for having me here today. Uh, my name is Fran Mendez. Uh, let me learn how to use this first. This is not mine. Uh, as I said, um, my name is Fran Mendez. I am um, the founder of the Async API initiative. Uh, how many of you have heard of Async API already? Oh, this is good. I'm in, in the right place. Most of you didn't hear about it. So, um, and how many of you know about OpenAPI? The OpenAPI specification. Okay, a little bit more. Cool. So, I'm going to continue. Uh, today, what I'm, what I'm going to explain is about um, Async API and a little bit about event-driven uh, uh, API management, or sorry, API management for event-driven uh, services, architectures, and all this stuff. As Marika said, this is highly confusing because we tend not to see uh, event-driven APIs, uh, event-driven microservices, or event-driven architectures as APIs, but they are. Cool, so, but before we jump there, let me tell you a bit of a personal story. Yeah, this is me. I got the worst over time. Um, I started coding when I was 11 years old. And it all started by, by a dream or, or, or by a lie, whatever you want to call it. Um, my, my brother told me, look, Fran, if you learn to code, you will be able to create your own video game. <laughs> to an 11 years old uh, kid. So, what happened next is, okay, <laughs> hold my beer, right? Or hold my juice. <laughs> I'm, I'm 11 years old. And uh, I'm, I'm going to start coding. Uh, over time, over years, it was my main goal. Like, I want to build uh, um, um, a game, a video game. But, over time as well, I realized this is not as easy as I thought. And it's not just a matter of programming, because now I know how to code all these little things, or at least most of them. Uh, so this is not code. Yeah, I'm missing the design part. I need to learn design. So I studied design, <laughs> believe it or not. Uh, on top of that, I have, to, uh, I have to add that I come from a very small town in the south of Spain, and I never met until I was really, uh, let's say, grown up. I never met anyone who codes or who do design or video game design. So that was disappointing, actually. So what you do is you learn to do it yourself. You do all things. And then over time, it's like, okay, I, now I have a little bit of experience using Photoshop and all this stuff, uh, but I'm not a designer. I'm not very creative in designing. Uh, even though I can manage to do some stuff. Uh, yeah, but, you know, the problem is that the video game is not just design and coding. It's also, you know, telling a story and inventing something really cool. So... Hmm. What happened was uh, hmm, it was a, revela a revelation to me. This is not a one-man show. Let's say this is not a one-man work. This is this is a teamwork actually. Building a video game now it's clear because we all know the large teams that build video games, right? Uh, but in that time it wasn't clear. Like uh, who knows who was building that, right? Um, so yeah, so I realized about it and it's like okay, here I cannot have my team or create a team or or join in an existing one. So my, th my thought immediately was like, I have to move somewhere else. So I moved to Barcelona. I moved to Barcelona to find this team. But this time, over time, because it, things evolve, right? I thought, mm, now the video game is not so, so much what I want to do. I, do. I want to do some cool stuff, some cool web applications, microservices, all this stuff, right? So, over time, I joined New Relic, uh, and they put me in charge, together with my friend Bruno, um, to build an, uh, uh, an integrations platform for them. Internal one, just, for, just to start. And it more or less, in the beginning, looked like this. 
And I know I said that I am a designer, <laughs> but you can see what kind of designer I am. Um, it was more or less like mm, a small team with a few services and an event broker in the middle. The event broker in this case was Kafka. Okay, so we're all familiar with that, I guess, or more or less. Um, it was easy to build something there. Really easy. We were just like uh, Bruno and I, and then we grew until four, yeah, to four. And it was really easy to manage. We did something like this. After some time, it was a little bit less easy <laughs> to, to, to manage because all of them are services and services communicating to each other, sending messages, receiving messages. And the, 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 the real question here was, who knows what's happening in the whole architecture, in the whole infrastructure? Nobody, I mean, we were coding this and we knew that this message goes there because then we want this thing to happen and blah, 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 blah. But is it really happening or there is a bug? Uh, we're New Relic, <laughs> we're a monitoring company, supposedly we need to know what's happening, right? Uh, no, we didn't have a way to know it. And, and, I, and I don't mean what's happening if the communication fails or something like that. No, it's, it's the business view or the whole thing. Like, if I trigger this message here, who's consuming this message and what other messages are being triggered? And then what, what's, the conse what's the consequence from beginning to end of sending a message to, to Kafka? We didn't have a view on that. But the worst thing is when they ask it as to, hey, now it's not your team anymore. It's not just your, your staff now. Now the whole company is going to integrate there. So everybody's going to start sending messages there to, I mean, they were already uh, doing it, but you will have to subscribe to all these messages, and you will have to figure out uh, how to in, in create the integration platform for all the teams at New Relic. This is, um, I don't have the numbers, but I think New Relic is about uh, 5,000 people, more or less. And you can, you can imagine that this is a distributed team, right? It's not just in Barcelona. So it's Barcelona, it's Portland, it's San Francisco, it's, it's in Japan, Australia, right? So, what happens is time zones. Suddenly it's like, hmm, if I, or if I ask someone to, to do something on, on the other side of the world, it's not going to get 24 hours. Something really quick and easy. It's going to get more time. It's going to get at least 48 hours for something really simple, most of the time. And Coming back a little bit to this diagram, what worries me the most here is not actually that these are services and these are messages flowing. When you look at this, the problem is not the services sending messages. When you look at this, the problem is that they represent people working together. These are actually people communicating to each other, teams communicating to each other in different time zones. So then, what happens? Communication is really bad, right? Because something doesn't work there, right? So if you don't have a, a management strategy there for that communication, that communication management, right? Uh, there's a problem, there's actually a problem. And on top of that, if you don't have any idea of what's happening, when you send this message uh, from, uh, from beginning to end, what happens when you send this message to the broker? This becomes like highly confusing and, and then you have um, people from your company uh, coming or teams from your company coming to you, uh, hey Frank, what happens if I send this? Why am I, not, am I not receiving this other thing? I don't know, that's the problem. <laughs> that's, that's the real problem, you don't know. <laughs> So, I like to, to, to play a little bit bingo here with you all. 
We're not going to play real bingo. <laughs> but to illustrate what I'm talking about, let's put this uh, as an example. So the bingo game is, is an example of an event-driven uh, communication. I keep uh, just uh, getting some, some balls with numbers, and I read it. So I'm publishing a message, right? I read it, I read it, and then you're hearing me, and you're, you're listening and say, okay, five, I have it. Ten, I don't have it, so I don't, I don't do anything. And at some point, some of you, someone of, of you is going to say, bingo, right? So you're publishing a message, and I'll, I'm going to receive it. This, that sounds very, like, eh, I know, Frank, it's just very obvious, right? There is something, there is an implicit uh, contract in what we're doing here. Actually, it's already happening here while we're here. There's an implicit contract. Y es que todos estáis esperando a que yo hable inglés. Si yo cambio el idioma... How many of you understand? <laughs> I see some Spanish. <laughs> That's the problem, right? We implicitly agreed on a contract, which is the language. And with event-driven APIs or with event-driven microservices or events or whatever you want to call it, right? we don't have contracts. We do have it for REST APIs, but we don't have it for uh, event-driven APIs. We didn't have. Now we have a async API. Right? So just to illustrate a little bit what, we, what I'm talking about is async API is like open API for events, if you want to look at this, look at it like this. Uh, actually, it's compatible. And this is a, a small example that I always use uh, to compare. I don't know if you can read it properly. I'm not sure, but uh, on the left side, we have a REST API, or HTTP API, let's not call it REST, um, which uh, content on the request body is a, is a is a JSON object representing a user. So this is post users, and the schema of this uh, request body is a JSON object with full name, birth date, and email. So far, it's, it's, it's simple, right? But then on the right side, imagine this scenario. You have a REST API or an HTTP API, and when someone calls the post users, you want it to trigger an event to inform the rest of the users that the user has been created after you save it to the database and all this stuff, right? Um, so this is what we have. This event is what we have on the, on the right side, documented with async API. As you can see, they are very similar. Actually, it all started by cloning open API and tweaking. That's how it all started. It says channels slash user slash created. So user created. It means publish. It means that your application is going to publish to, let's say, Kafka, for instance. Uh, a message with which payload is uh, an object, a JSON object with this same uh, attributes, the same that we, we saw here. If you see, there is, a, there is a common payload description between both, and you can reuse uh, you can actually reuse both. That was done on purpose, so you can actually uh, make it, let's say, e to make it easier for you to to to, uh, to reuse your descriptions, right? So if you if you're interested in in playing a little bit with async API, I really recommend uh, going to playground.asyncapi.io. As you can see, briefly, this brief description of this. Left side is the code, the, 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 the document. Right side is um, HTML documentation. HTML documentation, right? And it can also generate markdown documentation, all this stuff. Let's, let's not stop so much here. So the specification. You can describe, as I said, event-driven microservices, IoT APIs, streaming APIs, 
stream data folks are around. They are, they're offering uh, s streaming APIs. Uh, I think they call it as hybrid cloud, or I don't remember to be honest. And we offer some tooling as well, like code generators, documentation generators, and, and an online editor, which is now the playground. And or you can go to the previous one, which is editor. .asyncapi.org. It works with most of the, the protocols out there. As, uh, and actually, it, it works with any protocol. We don't enforce any particular protocol. So if you're using a protocol that's not on the list, it's, uh, it's fine. That it's going to work. So async API, unlike OpenAPI, for instance, OpenAPI is tied to HTTP. Uh, async API cannot do that because there are many messaging protocols. And what I said before, why all of this? To define a common language. Will you sign a contract that's not written somewhere else? Will you accept a contract if, if, if someone doesn't give it to you written somewhere in a language that you understand? Then why are we doing this with, uh, with event-driven communication, right? And Briefly, let's go into, into um, what I said before, the event-driven uh, or event management or API management for event-driven APIs. There's, not, there's no name yet for this. It's so new that nobody has a name for this. So we propose event management. <laughs> it might uh, collide with some people organizing events, so uh, I don't know. Um, and the thing is, we're launching soon. We have right now beta testing this uh, async API stream. This this works uh, with Kafka, but it's gonna be soon uh, augmented to work with other protocols. Uh, for instance, AMQP for RabbitMQ and uh, all this stuff, right? And MQTT and what is async API stream? So async API stream, think about it. Um, think about API management platforms for uh, REST APIs. What they provide you um, is actually, for instance, validation on the, on the edge. Like whenever someone makes a request, enforce a specific open API document, right? So you m make sure that you're receiving proper information, right? or information with the proper shape. We do the same by sitting between the broker and the publisher. So whenever someone sends a message to Kafka, we make sure that the, the, the message has um, the proper shape, as I, as I said. But that's not the only, that's not the only feature, let's say. So, the cool thing here is that even if you don't validate this message because of there are two philosophies, right? Lately, the, 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 the one that's winning is a microservices philosophy. And if I remember correctly, it's a smart endpoints dump pipes. So if I put this in the middle to validate it, I'm doing smart pipes. So it has its own use cases, of course, but not for microservices. Um, so, I, how much time do I have? Because I. <laughs> okay, okay, sorry. Okay, so, um, yeah, very briefly, sorry. So, the thing is, because we're sitting in the middle and we know all this information, we can draw a map of all the messages, how, how the communication is done between all the services. So it means, effectively, what it means is that you will, you will be able to understand your, uh, your whole architecture and you will be able to manage it and also monitor it. So again, it's API management for event-driven architectures. Why API management? Because APIs are not just HTTP stuff. I love it, but it's not just that. So whenever you use a message to trigger uh, a function in some other place, this is already an API, right? So 
if you want to know more, and because I think uh, we cannot stand so much, uh, I recommend visiting nacingkpi.com and just reaching out to me here. I'll be happy to chat, and I can explain in, in, in more depth. And well, thank you. Thank you, Fran.